start. All right. All right, guys, welcome to another Renal Pathology web series. I am so pleased to be back in my training institution at Rush Medical Center. I'll let uh, Dr. Rodby, my former program director, kind of give a brief intro on yourself and where we can follow you on Twitter. Uh, as Tim said, I'm a program director at Rush. Uh, been doing it for 20 years almost, um, and we're happy to have Tim back, one of our supreme fellows who's uh, created this great system of, uh, of education. I'm very proud of him, um, and I'm glad to be a part of it today. Uh, I'm Nefrodby, uh, at Nefrodby, so you need to follow me. That's the okay. most important part of this webinar. <laughs> Okay, and we're also joined by a now second-year fellow, is that right? Yes, yes. So chief, chief fellow. Chief fellow. I'll let uh, Chai introduce herself, too. Yeah, I'm uh, one of the second-year fellows here at Rush, uh, Charissa Karag. My Twitter handle is at So. All right, so in this um, case, I'm going to be uh, moderating a brief discussion. I'm going to have uh, uh, Cha uh, play the role of, well, a renal fellow who is interpreting um, the histology as if she were at a biopsy conference, and Roger, in this case, is going to be our uh, nephropathologist making sure that she's doing a good job. So let me give you the case introduction first. It's very brief. This is not much more information than, say, um, a nephropathologist would get when they're interpreting the, the history, so, uh, or when they're interpreting the images. So it's a 63-year-old male, HIV and untreated hepatitis C uh, due to IV drug abuse. He's hospitalized for volume overload. The creatinine is 2.6. We don't know what a baseline is. Uh, urinalysis shows 3 plus protein, 3 plus blood, and RBC casts on the urine sediment. A 24-hour urine collection shows 8.2 grams of proteinurium. And at the time of this biopsy, all secondary workup is pending. So, Child, let's just start. When you're given this history, then what are some of the things you're thinking about and what are you going to be looking for on uh, the kidney biopsy? Um, so, essentially, we're presented with a 63-year-old male. He has HIV. He has untreated hep C and is presenting with an elevated creatinine. We don't know his baseline. He has nephrotic range proteinuria with um, hematuria, mm -hmm. also an RBC cast. So um, my differentials would be just because of him having HIV, we don't know his status. Could he have like an FSGS um, mm -hmm. in the setting of his um, nephrotic range proteinuria? Could it be like a collapsing form of FSGS um, in the setting of his untreated hep C? Um, and hematuria, um, could he have like a, like a cryoglobulinemia, like an MPGN type of picture? Um, is this, he's 60 years old, is this like a membranous that um, could he have like an underlying malignancy or could this be primary membranous? Um, we're not sure what his meds are, if he's on NSAIDs, it could be like minimal change too. Mm -hmm. And I guess just because it's, um, like hematuria, he could also have an IgA. I'm not sure if he's Hispanic or Asian. Mm -hmm. um, really, it's like a broad like a set of differentials. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's um, walk through some of the biopsy images. Roger, I'm going to give you the mouse, so you're welcome to use the pointer. Uh, and why don't you just walk Chow through this and ask any questions you may have while interpreting it. So uh, you want to start and tell us what you see and what uh, stain? Yeah, so this is a trichrome stain, um, essentially looking for blue staining material to look for areas of fibrosis. Um, I think there are some blue staining materials on the, the right, right side of the core, um, right, or the right core rather. Um, and then a little bit also on the left side. I would say if I have to give an estimate of uh, maybe around like 30% fibrosis, just in terms of the blue staining material. I think it's probably a little bit higher, but yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean here is, yeah. there aren't a lot of tubules left yeah. if you look. Yeah. Um, here there's more tubules left, so I, yeah. I, I don't know, the pathology is always a mystery no matter what we say, you can always subtract or okay. <laughs> add 10 to whatever they say, but uh, yeah. I would say it's over 50, okay. I don't know what the official reading was, but it's significant. Okay. okay. So let's look at the same kind of low power through a different stain. So this is another low power, this time H and E. Um, we see a few gloms, um, I think over the the right lower one, there is like a glom there that's chlorosed. Mm -hmm. And then right, good. The, uh, there are there three gloms on the left side, um, which look full from this view. Um, I, I'll comment on them like another. What, what do you mean by full? 
Um, it's just I don't see a lot of like open um, capillary loops from this view, I think. Mm -hmm. They're like kind of like just condensed, I think. Um, not a lot of um, infiltrates within the interstitium, I like to say. Um, you're not a lot of cells that I'm seeing, so. Yeah, I'll give you some higher uh, okay. powers of okay. the glomeruli, but I think you're, you're absolutely on the right path. I think at this power, I was always taught, you shouldn't really comment too much on the glomeruli because mm -hmm. you can't, uh, unless there's something obvious like a huge crescent. Yeah. But I think you can notice that the glomeruli look somewhat abnormal here. Yes, and we're going to focus yes. on some kind of pathology. So I'll give you a higher power now so you can yes. take a better look. So way. this is now a high power um, H&E stain. We have one glomerulus. Um, yeah, it um, looks like lobular essentially because uh, you have mesangial expansion, um, you have some mesangial hypercellularity. There are some open capillary loops, but otherwise, some some parts are like I would say like close. Like there's uh, like endocapillary pr proliferation. I have to say. Um, so this is kind of um, in terms of like the differentials that I g gave earlier. This is um, pointing more towards like an MPGN like type of picture, just because it looks like lobular, kind of like the like the buzzword. Sure. <laughs> yeah, How do that. loops look to you? Do they look uh, normal? Some of the loops. Um. Maybe here and maybe here. Yeah, I guess there's the the thickened um, like capillary loops. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, a lot of mesangial expansion. It is a good, this one is yeah. very thick here. I, yeah. I assume that's the full. Yeah. If that were lupus, what would we call that lesion? Um, it's like almost like a wire loop. Yeah, like a wire yeah, loop. Yeah. Looks like a wire loop to me. Okay. Yeah. So do you know what a, what a wire loop um, actually is? Like if, um, i trying to like phrase the question. So a, a wire loops image on light microscopy looks that way because of a massive subendothelial deposit, typically. Okay, yeah. Um, so let me give you another image okay. of a, another H&E. Um, so this is another high power H&E stain. Again, a lot of um, mesangial expansion and hypercellularity. Um, you still see some open capillary loops, but um, yeah, I think um, there are areas of like thick and capillary loops also in this um, in this view, like over there. Yeah. Yeah. Anything to add on this image compared to the other glomerulus, Roger? Like no, no. I just it's not real cellular. I mean, a lot mm -hmm. of these uh, look almost like just mesangial, uh, the mesangial tree kind of going up. Okay. But you don't really see a lot of open capillary loops. Mm -hmm. so this the patient's creatinine was what two something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you have to kind of look at it too in the context of two. Why is this mm -hmm. creatinine two? Is it mm -hmm. glomerular disease, glomerular dropout? Is it interstitial disease, combination of both, acute renal failure, et cetera? We'll get a little more information. Okay, here's a different stain. So this is now a PAS stain, still high power. Um, a lot of like pink staining material, like within the mesangium, signifying, again, mesangial expansion. Um, yeah, I guess now you can see really like the thick and capillary loops um, in some of them. It's, like, it's more yeah, highlighted. Most of them, yeah. yeah, pretty thick. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, just the tubules around it, I think they look okay. They might be a little atrophic here. It's a little okay. thicker okay. base membrane. Some of these might be chronically damaged. It's hard mm -hmm. to say. Now, you mentioned earlier this kind of a nodular, or you actually use term. Uh, uh, lobular. lobular. Yeah, so this is lobular, nodular. Um, do you have a differential diagnosis of some of the lobular or nodular rather glomerular lesions uh, that we should at least bring up in the context of this? Um, I guess if it's like nodular, we always say, we always bring up like dia diabetes. Okay. Um, not sure Does it look like diabetes at all? Um, it doesn't really look like the typical KW nodules that we see. Um, I mean, it could still be, but it's just not like the typical like AW nodules. I agree, but if you kind of look, and yeah. I totally agree with yeah. you, but if you kind of look, you know, they're yeah. described as the petals yeah. you know, of a daisy outside yeah. of this lesion, and you've got kind of a, a sense of that. I mean, yeah. looks like there's these 
markedly expanded mesangular areas with capillary loops outside. What else gives a, a nodular? Um, like amyloid is also in the differential, but that would be um, less like uh, lightly PAS staining. Wow, look at you. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> yeah. Good so, point. Um, which is in this um, very slides very PAS strongly PAS positive. Yeah. What else? Um, like light chain deposition Good. disease is yeah. also in the differential. Um, yeah. And of course, idiopathic. Idiopathic. Related uh, to smoking. Smoking, yeah. 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 Um, so I'm going to give you a stain now, uh, which, if when we're, especially when we're talking about nodular glomerular sclerosis, the silver I think is really important. Um, I, so, since, since membranous was on your differential? Um, yeah, so for if we're thinking membranous, we're looking for spikes um, or holes, which um, within the the loops, I don't really see any. Um, and then you're also looking for double contours or breaks, uh, which I'm not sure over, yeah, over there, that's a double contour that we're seeing. Okay. Um, and you know, they're there too. I don't see any like like breaks, um, which we should expect. Which I didn't really see like segment a lot of like segmental lesions in the in the necrosis. Are, like necrosis breaks, yeah. 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 So what's the main thing you're seeing here is M mostly double contours. Mm -hmm. um, now what a, do you, Chad? Do you think this is a double contour? This widely separated one right here. Um, yeah, I think so. So if that is, why would this one be so massively? Uh, expanded. This would be from like immune complex deposition. And yeah, yeah and oftentimes yeah. cells will migrate in there. So you get the mesangial interposition. Yeah, and I don't know if that's what's going on here, but that's what yeah. I'm thinking might be going right. on here. Yeah. Now, if I looked at this loop, I don't think I would have said that by itself, but in the context of what we've seen, a, 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 a lobular glomerular nephritis with double contours, now I'm looking for mesangular interposition and I'm more confident this might be the second base of membrane and this might be mesangular interposition. Um, Tim, is that fair? I think that's, I agree with you 100%. Okay. Yep. Yeah, and the, and the buzzword often in boards is, it, you know, they'll say double contours, but they'll also say tram tracking. Tram tracking, yeah. yeah. All right, so let's look at some IF. Um, so just to go through it relatively quickly, IgM was positive in the capillary loop. Uh, again, kind of like this granular, coarse granular appearance in the capillary loop positive for IgM, IgA, IgG, and C3. So um, definitely immune complex mediated capillary loop staining. So now let's look at those capillary loops on EM and let's uh, take it back to So this. this is an EM, that's the uh, blood space. Uh, and in the urinary space, we see uh, like a very, I mean, we don't have a measurement here, but it looks like very thick in um, um, like uh, GBM. Um, and you actually see like deposits um, like in the middle almost, I would say it's probably intramembranous. Um, what about these? The, uh, that is, those are also, I would say like deposits, um, if I have to say where they are, almost looks like um, sub, like epithelial. I think it would be further up. Okay. Oh, sorry, su subendothelia. Yeah, right, right, sorry. Yeah, yeah. subendothelia. Yeah. Sorry. So, um, so that's the last image. So summing up the case. So can you um, make a histologic diagnosis based on everything that we saw here? Yeah, so in the light, um, the uh, HNE stain, we saw like the lobular appearance with endocapillary capillary proliferation, which is also seen in the PAS, the double contours on the silver stain, um, positive immunofluorescence and intramembranous and subendothelial deposits on EM. I think they all point to MPGN. Nice, very good. And uh, so that's, sorry, that's um, exactly what it was signed out as, and in, in the context of this patient who had 
uh, untreated HIV and hepatitis C, it was felt more strongly likely to be from hepatitis C. Um, so I don't want to get into this too much, but I think um, you know MPGN is one of those diseases that oftentimes is commonly associated with hepatitis C. When we see patients with Hep C, we reflexively say, "Oh, maybe they have MPGN with or without the cryos." But there are other things that can be associated with Hep C as well: IgA nephropathy, FSGS, or um, organized deposits in a fibrillary or in an immunotactoid process. Um, but in all of the diseases that are uh, Hep C related GNs, um, I personally think that the treatment of Hep C with the direct anti acting antivirals is probably one of the most revolutionary things that I've seen in my medical career. Because I remember when I was a fellow, when we would have these patients, we had no option but really to give them immunosuppression. You know, their, their kidney function was too poor to tolerate interferon or ribavirin. They didn't respond very well to it. Those medicines were toxic to the kidney. Oh. Uh, but now we have the option to give them antivirals, which target the antigen, remove the antigen. Uh, and if you can't do that, you still have the options of immunosuppression. So I think that's pretty remarkable. And I think there's still a role for immunosuppression if it's a rip roaring, crescentic uh, GN, and with, sure. perhaps with cryoglobulin, even with, uh, with plasmapheresis. Yeah. Um, kind of depends in my mind what is the predominant problem here. If it's a if it's an RPGN like picture, I don't know that you always want to wait for the antivirals to work. Yeah. Um, Right. But uh, it is an amazing story, like you say. Yeah. I'll give one more quick perspective, if I might. Sure. I mean, when I was a fellow, there was no hepatitis C test. It was non-A, non-B hepatitis. And, and we knew these people had a disease. We figured it was a virus, but they had no test for it. There was also two other diseases out there that were thought to be idiopathic. One was idiopathic cryoglobulinemia, and the other one out there was idiopathic MPGN. And then once finally, they had developed a test for hepatitis C, we were able to go back and realize that many of these, idiop the majority of these idiopathic cryoglobulinemias was a new complex related to chronic infection with the hepatitis C virus. And a lot of the idiopathic MPGNs are now, uh, were related to that. And now most of the idi those idiopathics are gone. There's still a 10% subset of patients with MPGN. We don't know what's going on. And maybe cryoglobulinemia, and I assume that's just gonna be the next hep hepatitis once we find out that's not A, non B, non C, there'll be some other virus that's probably doing this, and we'll, you know, hopefully uh, get a better handle on that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, you talk about not even seeing the advent of these medications. I, I remember the advent; we didn't even know the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. it's the, the paradigm has changed totally, and it's a and it's a huge success story. Yeah. So let, let me ask, like, if you if you were to like see this patient on inpatient consult at Rush Hospital. Uh, and you did the biopsy and you get this histology and you have this presentation where the patient has a cranny of 2.6 with this amount of fibrosis. Is your first response to uh, give immunosuppression now or is it, would you say, let's, let's treat uh, with antivirals? This patient, assuming he doesn't have acute renal failure, I would treat with antivirals. Well, let's say he has a cranny of 2.6 like he does and you don't know his baseline. I probably, I don't see uh, crescents, I don't see cryothrombi, the kind of things that would, that would make me want to jump on it right away. So I would still go with antivirals. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's remarkable because that option has literally only existed for a couple of years. Yeah, but I think it's an incredible story. Well, yeah, I mean, again, I'm dating myself, but I never thought there would be a treatment for HIV, and I never thought there would be not only a treatment for hepatitis C, but a cure for hepatitis yeah. C. Yeah. It's absolutely incredible. Yeah. Uh, okay, so that wraps up this episode. Um, you guys know where to follow me. I just want to again say thank you so much to both of our discussants. It's, it's good to be home here at Rush. Welcome home. You should stay. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about that offline. <laughs> uh, so we're going to end this one. I'm going to do a couple more recordings with these guys for the next few episodes. Thanks for tuning in.